thank you for having me on. It's great to be here tonight. Um, so the bond is a mixed use uh, mass timber project, um, mainly office space and the sites out in Bella Vista in Sydney's Northwest in what's going to be a new business precinct um, that, that promotes contemporary and flexible working. So our site sits on a hillside, uh, which and the site was originally owned by a brick manufacturer, which inspired the angular brick podium that folds up out of the landscape. Um, on top of that podium are terraces with a, um, a green edge that sort of spills over the edge of that brickwork and softens the form and the hard geometry and really grounds the podium into that hillside. And then on top of that is the six story timber tower, um, which is really the showstopper. That's what we're here to talk about today. So the, uh, the timber structure echoes the um, Bella Vista farmstead, which sits on top of the hill that we're on the side of, and it overlooks our site and is quite um, historically significant to the area. So we took inspiration from that and that led us into having um, our mass timber structure that's made with CLT slabs and glue lamb beams and columns. And then we have quite a simple facade that wraps that tower um, that we've kept very unadorned and very clear to really let the timber that we're keeping exposed speak of the character and, um, <clears throat> sorry, really, really define the, um, the beauty and the character of the building and let the occupants within um, provide that visual um, activity within. Mm. And there's always a, different reasons why timber is uh, chosen for the project. What was the uh, reasoning in, in this case? Um, there were a few different reasons, actually. Um, obviously, the driving force at the inception was Fitzpatrick and Partners director, James Fitzpatrick, who you've had on the podcast before. Um, you'll know that he's very passionate about both the beauty and the environmental benefits of using timber, um, which is showcased in his gorgeous house. Um, but he was able to convince the rest of the team on the project with a number of different benefits. And they are obviously the environmental benefits. Um, you've got the fact that it significantly reduces the carbon footprint. Um, it can be reused at the end of a building's lifespan and it can be regrown fairly quickly. Uh, you've also got the benefit of a faster construction time because the, the timber pieces erect quite quickly and then you can start hanging your facade off of it, off the slabs. You don't have to wait for concrete to cure. Um, you've got the benefit of timber being a very beautiful material to use, which is why we've chosen to leave it exposed in this project. And then you've got the biophilic benefits of using uh, a natural material. Um, you get that more warm, more warm and inviting tactility, and even even something like the smell of timber actually gives you a, a wellness benefit. And actually, we're finding that there's a lot of value in the market of having healthier um, workspaces that actually put a benefit on wellness, because your tenants end up with employees having fewer sick days and higher productivity and engagement at work. So there's actually a tangible financial benefit to building a healthier environment for us, for us all to work in. And then, of course, you've got the fact that it makes the building very unique for the area. I mean, you know, mass timber buildings aren't that common, but this one um, has not only commercial and retail spaces, which we've seen done before, but it's got daycare and healthcare spaces in, which is a bit of a game changer in the industry. And the fact that it's not in a CBD setting, which is where we've seen most of the mass timber projects in Australia so far. Yeah, well, there's a lot of big reasons you've Names there. One that doesn't get named as much, which you do me did mention, is uh, design for disassembly or the ability to to reuse it. I mean, was this a focus up front? And can you tell us a little bit more about um, that driver? Yeah, I mean, it was a 
it was a focus in terms of it being a contributing factor to the environmental benefit of it. Obviously, sustainability is something that Fitzpatrick and Partners values a lot. And thankfully, we had a, a team on the project, um, client and consultant side, who understood that benefit and were really keen to push the envelope in that area. So mm -hmm. part of the selling of that uh, of that as a, as a benefit was the fact that at the end of this building's lifespan, you can take the pieces apart and you can reuse them or reappropriate them instead of with um, concrete where you would just have to smash it to bits really. And you might be able to grind it down and, and reuse it as aggregate somewhere else, but it's, it's not as reworkable as timber. Mm. So this, the structure for this uh, project is bolted together with steel connection plates. Um, so at the end of the building's life, you just disconnect the pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, toward the end of the life, whatever it's 50 years, there's probably going to be a reuse market there, um, which is exciting. Can you give us a bit of an overview of the design of the project and, and how that process evolves and, um, and was finalised? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I spoke a little bit about it already that we had um, inspiration quite early on from the site and were able to um, really create a language of this brick that comes up out of the hillside and to have our, um, <clears throat> our timber tower sat on top of that. Yeah. Um, but the project's the first one in a master plan of three buildings that will eventually sit on the site. And taking this sort of um, geological inspiration, we ended up with conceptually something like a geode where you had quite a rough, very solid, um, textured and dark exterior to these what will be three buildings. And then in the central space that's going to be um, like campus style plaza space that's got a very permeable ground plane between all three of the buildings. You get these very crystalline facades above that really showcase the activity in the building and the timber inside. Really, we wanted to make that the hero of the building. And uh, you, you did mention another one of the benefits was around the program. Uh, what is the program for the project that uh, it's been looking to achieve and you know what are some of the, the ways to maximize the productivity in that sense well um they're looking to complete it at the end of this year um so hopefully in this coming month we should see the timber on site um we've had a few delays we're speaking in uh for those listening we're speaking in april april now but april 2022 that's it yeah um yeah. So we've had a few delays there with obviously the terrible weather that we've had and uh, the pandemic, but all going well, we should uh, wrap it up at the end of this year. Yeah, definitely. Well, you've, you've mentioned a few of the challenges you've had right there. What have, what have been some of the major challenges that you've been working through on this project? Um, I would say we probably had four big challenges or yeah, four easily categorized challenges. Um, the first one was to get everybody on board at the beginning of the project, because this one was conceived in 2017. Um, and that was around the time that International House was being built and finished off. So timber really was a, an unknown at the time. So to get everyone on board in terms of, you know, doing something that they hadn't done before. And there were obviously concerns about costs and about engineering and compliance. So we really had to put the legwork in at the very beginning um, and get all of our friends to give us some input, our friends in the industry, um, so that we could show that this was a, a viable option from the start. And thankfully, as I said, everybody's been very positive and has jumped on with enthusiasm. The next uh, big challenges was services coordination. Obviously, when you've got a timber building, you can't, you don't have as much flexibility as you do with something like concrete, where you can core holes in later, or you can just change the formwork a bit on site. Uh, with timber, you have to have a lot of it figured out quite early on. So that was that was quite a challenge to get. Um, 
to get the, the services input so early during the design phases. So that's not, not usually the way it's done. Um, our next speed bump was uh, the addition of 9A class use, which is healthcare because that obviously has a lot more in the way of services demands and um, compliance issues. It's much more stringent in those areas. So um, when that was introduced into the project, it was quite a challenge to work through all of the impacts that that was going to have and still get everything to stack up from viability and a, and a spatial point of view. And finally was obviously the pandemic. We had all of our delays, but also we had a huge spike in the cost of timber. So that was quite problematic, but um, everybody rallied together and we worked with the um, engineers and with the manufacturers to rework the timber structure to get something that was more um, standardized to their manufacturing processes so that we could get the budget back under control. Yeah, fantastic. So there's, there's a lot in those ones. Um, do you think in general, working out the design up front is critical in, in all mass timber projects? And um, I mean, services in, included into that package. Uh, and so you work out everything right up front um, in the BIM environment. And was it the architect's role really in leading the, the BIM coordination or was it you know, a supplier, for example? Because I've noticed sometimes that shifts. Mm -hmm. Well, we worked out as much as we could at the time. Um, obviously, you know, yourself, if you've been involved, uh, things change, things evolve as you, as you go. I mean, we're four and a half years into this project now. Um, so I think the goalposts do move a bit. Um, but yeah, we had a, a lot of early involvement from the structural engineers, um, some of the guys at... Um, strong build and as well the services engineers to get everybody in the room and get as much worked out as we could in the beginning so that even if we didn't have all the answers we had some allowances for those things in the future and we did get down to the the nuts and bolts of everything um, but yeah 3d modeling has been absolutely critical in getting the coordination across the line and i think although that's fairly standard in the industry, especially with this scale of building. Um, to have both your design, uh, to have your designers, your engineers, but as well your um, subcontractors and your manufacturers to be all sharing in a model space is really how you get something like this across the line because you can't just um, come back and, and move something or punch a new penetration in. It's all yeah. been calculated. Well, for the project, for the services, was there running, um, you know, through penetrations through beams or was it there an access floor? How, how were the penetrations uh, worked out for this project? Um, that was um, a long process. Um, so we, we ended up with a, an 8.4 square grid and that was shaken out of three different key areas. One was obviously the parking in the basement, the other was getting everything to work in plan to be both flexible for full floor tenants and also smaller tenancies. And then the third aspect to consider was what's happening in section and those floor to floors and how we reticulate all of the services through the building. So we did a number of studies on whether we would punch through the beams, whether we would um, offset the beams and run our services over the beams whether we tuck them under or whether we would do, as you've just mentioned, a raised access floor and get the services in there. But by the time we'd run all of these, um, the best solution for this project was to run our services underneath the beams. So we, we did a, a series of future proofing exercises um, and incorporated notches and penetrations in the beams that were small enough to not need steel plate reinforcings because we were trying to keep the cost down. It's not a, a CBD project with a very high end budget. Um, so that was something that we just, we couldn't stack up in a viability point of view. So we have most of our services running underneath the beams at high level. 
um, with some, as I say, that go into notches in the bottoms of the beams or through. Yeah, wonderful. So uh, there's a lot of work's been taken into this project. It's obviously been on a journey. What have been some of the lessons that you've learned uh, learned so far on this one that you might take into future projects? Yeah, I think um, early expert involvement is key. Um, that's something that we were very fortunate to have on this project. Um, obviously, the later down the line that you decide to change something as fundamental as the structure, the harder it becomes. So if you know you want timber, I'd say start at the very beginning with timber if you can. Um, get some input from the structural engineers. And we also got in um, some timber experts. We got in the services engineers. Everybody was in the room at the beginning, the fire engineers as well, to, to talk about some of the, the bigger hurdles that we could see and try and figure that out as early as possible so that we weren't retroactively trying to, to squeeze a design into what will work. We had some of those answers from the beginning. Um, something else that I mentioned was the 3D modeling. Collaborative modeling is, is really important for a project like this. It's, it's just, it's great to be able to see all of the pieces in the model fly through, particularly with um, 9A use because the amount of services that you need is, is huge. So <laughs> you really need to have all of the services talking to each other, avoiding each other. Um, because you know, if you nominate a space and a ceiling, one trade may take it and not realize that somebody else has already earmarked it. So to get everything together in the model, not just working in plan, but working in 3D, really does nut out a lot of the headaches. And finally, I think um, a lesson learned would be that you have to have passion for what you're doing. Whenever you're doing something that's not the standard, that's pushing a boundary or a little outside of the box of ordinary, there's a, it's not as straightforward and as easy as usual. So you really need to have that passion and that enthusiasm from the whole team to all be behind the idea to be supporting it. And I think one of the great things about this project is that we've had that and it's meant that we've weathered a few storms on the way and we're actually getting it built. So it's been really exciting, really rewarding so far. Fantastic. And, and uh, Fitzpatrick and Partners, you've been part of, as a company, part of the, you know, some very high profile projects since 2017. What have you seen the, the trends being? Do you see mass timber becoming more and more popular and being requested by um, some of the client briefs that you're that you're getting yeah definitely now that um since we've had a few projects that have actually been built and commercially stack up it's something that people are at least open to discussing now some people are obviously really keen on the idea and that's great um but now that there are examples that you can show people it breaks down some of those preconceptions that people might have and um, some of their reluctancies because you know it's it's been done before there are methods for doing this and there are there are ways that you can achieve what it is you're looking for and as I say now there's some of the research out about what benefit it has to the occupants of the building specifically and how that can stack up financially because your your space is obviously leased for a lot higher if you can um, talk about the benefits to employees and really I think that's so important considering we all spend most of our days in a, a commercial environment and those tend to be the areas that are most thirsty for um, warmth and character and something like timber is a, is a really simple way for you to be able to add that in without a lot of expense or complicated detailing so I think that in the future we're going to see a lot more timber in commercial spaces and um, <clears throat> sorry, I'd love to see Australia really stepping up and pushing itself forward as a leader in the supply of mass timber, because the capability is certainly there and the market's really starting to grow. So it'd be great if um, it wasn't just Europe being the biggest player in this field, if, if Australia could come in and, and really make its voice heard in the industry. 
Yeah, 100%. That's, uh, that's a great war cry for uh, all Australian suppliers. What do you see as the future of, um, of timber construction going forward as well? Do you, uh, are you excited about what's coming, coming ahead? Yeah, absolutely. With each one of these um, timber projects that gets completed, I think it, it inspires designers, engineers, consultants, each one of them, you, you learn lessons for the next one because it's very new uh, for mass timber in a, in a commercial setting anyway. We use it quite a bit in, in residential here, but not in the same way. Um, but as I say, it's just, it's just breaking through some of those boundaries. I mean, for the bond, we had to do quite a lot of fire testing for the various systems and the details, but that's been done now. So you can use that data for the next project. Um, so I, I hope and I think that we will see more of it in the future as people become accustomed to it and they, I, I think what would be really beneficial is to actually be inside one of these timber buildings. Because once you get in there, you actually start to understand the quality it brings to, to the space. That richness, the texture, the tactility, it's it, it makes a huge difference to the space that you're in yeah and it does tie to some of your, your challenges and your lessons learned i mean with every single project you've got another team of engineers uh, building surveyors quantity surveyors understanding how to price things better uh, building surveyors understanding the compliance pathway and of course if there is fire tests um there is a bank of it and it's ever increasing which you can use for, for future projects and i think that designers are becoming more willing to have the conversation about the lessons that they have learned on their projects because they see the benefit for the industry as a whole. I know when Timber first arrived in this capacity, um, there was you know, a little bit of reluctancy to, to share what it is you've learned and your knowledge and your skills and to kind of monopolize on your knowledge so that you're the person that, that people come to as the Timber expert. But now we're not seeing the same attitudes towards it. Everybody's just so keen to build more with timber and to understand it um, that I just, I don't think there's a place anymore for garden secrets. It really is a must in terms of firstly establishing decent sustainable design, but hopefully moving forward into the future, regenerative design. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a whole, uh, it's a whole new uh, kettle of fish, that one. So uh, it's been so good speaking to you today, Jessica. Uh, you're, you're obviously one of the leading experts in Australia. It's always great to have people like yourself on. If people want to find out more about yourself and the project, where, where should they go? Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn. And obviously, Fitzpatrick and Partners uh, have got a website, fitzpatrickpartners.com, where you can uh, read about the bond and see some of the imagery for the project.